I'm from Nebraska. Now, in Nebraska, you've got two things to have lawsuits over, corn and cattle, or their derivatives. So I want you to imagine practicing in a state where the lawsuits are about corn and cattle. There's a one-house, nonpartisan legislature, and it's adopted a statute that says nothing more than this, crude oil pipelines may exercise the power of eminent domain, period. Along comes a company that's well-financed, fairly well-known before they reach Nebraska, but not to Nebraskans. It's called TransCanada. And it decides it wants to build a pipeline across our state, and it isn't going to bisect anybody's farm or ranch. It's going to dissect it. No bisection, all dissection. We have the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution of the United States, a provision in the Nebraska State Constitution that says just compensation will be paid for takings or damages, and the enabling statute I told you about. So now the question is, what do we do with that? And let me suggest these arguments. First of all, let's talk about the scope of the taking. The pipeline company proposes to put in a machine. The machine has a useful life. The useful life is forecast to be 50 years. The machine proposes to take a perpetual easement to dissect the state's farms and ranches. Why should it be permitted to do that? What's the public use of taking a perpetual easement so that a private company can operate for profit by using a machine with a finite life. So the first argument is that taking ought to be restricted to the useful life of the forecasted project plus a reasonable period of time for some modest expansion and, as I'll get to in a moment, the removal of the remains of the worn out machine at the end. First argument, just compensation isn't the issue until you get to the definition of what can be taken and what can be taken should match the purpose. If the legislature authorizes it, it can't go beyond the forecasted use of the machine to be put in the dissected property. Secondly, the easement proposed says that at least in some circumstances, if there is an explosion, or if there is a spill, or if there is some other problem, then we'll apportion the fault with you, the landowner. But the landowner had no risk before the easement was taken. So the argument is that the takings provision of the federal constitution does not authorize the imposition of a new liability on the back of the landowner whose property is dissected. And the damages clause of the state constitution doesn't apply when the damage occurs and doesn't protect someone accused of being a tortfeasor, so the taking has to be restricted in this way. The pipeline company has to take 100% of the risk of its operations of all kinds with this exception. If somebody intentionally and willfully damages the pipeline and causes injury, they're liable for their intentional tort. So the scope of the taking, limited in duration and limited by imposing all of the responsibility on the private company that's engaged in the taking process. Third limitation, if the city of Omaha or one of our 15 counties with fewer than 1,000 residents exercises the power of eminent domain, that city or county can't sell that property to anybody without going through a public procedure. And that public procedure requires some determinations by the duly elected governing authority of the condemning authority, usually a county commission or a city council or a school board or something. 
A pipeline company that's given the power of eminent domain should be restricted in its authority to sell or dispose of the property taken or the project or its control by those same constraints. Otherwise, the public loses an enormous check that puts the property owner at a whole new set of risks not accounted for in the compensation formula because they're not subject to valuation. Let me give you an example. The Trans-Canada Pipeline, if built, would have been owned by a foreign private corporation. Now it so happens that the domicile of that foreign private corporation is a pretty good ally. Canada. But friendships change and relationships change and the marketplace changes lots of things and the pipeline could have been, would have been for sale. And the United States and the people of Nebraska and the landowner whose land is dissected have an interest in knowing who the next buyer will be. And from Nebraska's point of view, from the condemning authority's point of view, if you're a public condemning authority, there is a check in the election, the recall, the input to the governing body. The same parallel ought to apply as a constraint on the private company that is given the eminent domain privilege by a state legislature. And if the legislature didn't speak to it, the court should find that that constraint is present implicitly in the grant of taking authority. Okay, now let's get to money. So we're through what the taking should look like. We're through what is to be taken and we're up to the impact of dissection. In our state, when this happened, across the state, six of the properties that would have been dissected had the pipeline been built were owned by the same families who got the original patent from a president of the United States in 1867 through 1875. Nebraska became a state 148 years ago. So the question is, how should they be paid for the next 50 years of having the asset they've already held for 148 years dissected. It's highly unlikely these properties are going to become political subdivisions. Nebraska's had one new city in the last 35 years. It's highly unlikely they're gonna be added to another town. Every county in Nebraska, except those where we have meatpacking plants, is shrinking in population. It's highly unlikely that they're going to be devoted to a different use. They've come 148 years. A few have turned to irrigated farms, but otherwise it's the same. So this land has been making a living for the families that own it. Now it's gonna be dissected so somebody else can use a sliver of it and make a living with it. It's not becoming a park, not a highway, not a public use. This particular pipeline had no on-ramp, no off-ramp in Nebraska, none in South Dakota to our north, one in North Dakota to the north of that, none in Kansas to the south, and it finally hooked up with something in Oklahoma. So the argument is that the just compensation formula is not the before and after value because the before and after value has no market evidence, not of the kind just mentioned by Tommy. This isn't houses in town. This isn't gas pipelines. This is a crude oil pipeline. It's a different animal. And so the argument is that if this were a wind farm, we have those, there's no condemning authority for wind farms. The wind farm company has to negotiate an easement and has to pay a rent. And it has to pay it annually and it usually bases the rent formula on its production. Sometimes it's production plus profit. So the argument is that the compensation 
that the landowner should receive for the 50-year dissection of property to put in a 50-year machine to make a profit for somebody else should be rent. Rent can be appraised. Rent can be determined on a fair market value basis. Rent can be revisited. Rent makes sense. And the final thing then about this process sort of combines compensation and scope. Our friends from Canada proposed across our state that they would take an easement that would allow them to leave behind at the end of its utility the exhausted pipeline. Probably not full of sound and fury signifying nothing, but full of gunk. And so the argument quickly became and focused in large measure in our state on this. If you're going to put it in, you've got to take it out. If you're going to make a mess, you've got to clean it up. And if you're not going to do that, you're not welcome here. The easement has to contain that provision, or you can't take anything other than an easement with that provision. Nebraska became a, a really, really fun place to have a bunch of em eminent domain cases because our state Supreme Court's probably addressed 25 of them in 148 years. Maybe four or five of those have involved pipelines, and those four or five would be of the kind that Tommy talked about. All of the rest of this was theory. And sometimes it's a lot of fun to revisit the theory. Thank you. Maybe it's a good time now to take some questions if we've got uh, questions. And do we have some questions for our panel here? All right, for uh, Dave, two questions. Was he able to uh, get a judge to essentially rewrite the easement? That's number one. And then number two, was he able to get the court to order that the pipeline be dismantled at the end of the easement? So the answer to number one is that instead of directly rewriting an easement, a state trial court decided that the proposed taking was too constitutionally broad and struck it. The case went to the Nebraska Supreme Court where the issue was about the adequacy of the statute and whether the statute itself violated the state constitution. And there was a standing issue. And when William Jennings Bryan was running around, uh, uh, running for president every four or eight years, he persuaded the Nebraska Constitutional Convention in 1920 to require that the Supreme Court be 5-2 to declare a statute unconstitutional. It never occurred to him that that could result in a tie. And that's what happened, our Supreme Court tied. So we kept TransCanada in court for five and a half years over the issues we've been discussing until a friend of ours named Barack Obama, a lawyer from Illinois, <laughs> helped us out and stopped the project. I have a question, Dave. Because the, the uh, measuring damages by rents, uh, I know you, you talked, to, and there are vast differences between oil pipelines and natural gas pipelines. Are you advocating, though, that this new method of, of measuring just compensation with respect to rents and with periodic reviews should apply to such things as natural gas pipelines? Well, it seems to me it should apply to anybody who takes property from a private owner and uses it for a for-profit purpose. Uh, well, the uh, distinction should be about whether it's used for a profit. A natural gas company, though, they, they're, they're for-profit, but they're also providing, for example, they may have a franchise with the city of Nashville to supply natural gas to that, to that area. So it's for the public, but it's also a private company. You know, I, I, I understand that entirely. The Business can easily factor into its costs of doing business, and on a daily basis does so, factors in the cost of rent. And the pipeline companies, uh, you know, all of them have offices and headquarters and shops and things, and many times the buildings they use for those purposes are rented. They factor that rent into their operations. There's absolutely no reason they can't factor a rental factor into the cost of acquiring the right-of-way they need to operate the pipeline and then pay the property owner on a periodic basis. Now, I, if I were legislating, I would draw some distinctions. For example, if you're 
a telephone company and you're putting in a line and serving a city or a subdivision or even a rural user or offering the service to that rural user, then there is a utility aspect that I think doesn't require periodic rental review. But if there is no benefit to the land, no benefit to the present or foreseeable landowners, and there is an annual disruption in the use of the remainder after the easement is taken that adversely impacts annual income production, then the intelligent thing the owner would do would be to rent that problem away and get something back for it to compensate for the annual annoyance instead of being paid once. Uh, the reason I was asking, in Tennessee, I think uh, after Kelo, there was a discussion about adopting this method, but it, it was rejected in Tennessee, it's just before and after, uh, which so it would require a legislative. I, I think in some states it would, in a state like ours where there were no rules written, I, I think it'd be really interesting to bring in an appraiser who would say the, the, uh, the uh, measure of damages here on a before and after basis is rent. And here's what the rent should be, and here's what I forecast it will be for the duration of the project. The question is, uh, in states that bef have a strict before and after rule, how do you get into evidence uh, these studies of rent or, or damage? Yeah. And my answer to that would be, you know, you've got to make a record in every single case, put the evidence in the record in every single case, and pray that one of them reaches your appellate court because that's probably where the change is going to happen. And then what you need is, you know, create an issue of fact about what is the proper method of compensation. Uh, in most states, the before and after value is established by case law, and that case law generally has its origins in public takings, not takings by for-profit companies. And I, I think there is room for argument to appellate tribunals there, and we have to just work on it. The question is whether or not practitioners see any forum shopping by the uh, gas industry. And Tony's comment was it appears that sometimes the federal courts are more favorable or it's perceived that way than the state courts. And Dave, why don't you start off with come down the line here but and add to that, why didn't the, uh, the, the gas company try to get in the federal court in Nebraska? Uh, I, I don't have any experience with your question. I don't know. Our exposure is too narrow. And uh, um, the pipeline company, TransCanada, was litigation shy. They stayed away from the courtroom as much as they could. We drug them there. So we, we chose the forum and did it in a way that uh, made it, made, uh, that sealed them into the state court because you can't remove, of course, a Fifth Amendment taking case. Uh, on a federal, under federal question jurisdiction, so they were stuck there. The question is, how did Dave Domina in Nebraska make a case that would be, uh, Mark, you're saying, very expensive for a single owner, so what did you do to make that uh, successful? Well, it, um, it's a good question, and uh, it's interesting. If you, know, if you practice in a, in a small rural state, you know, every, every community needs somebody who becomes kind of the slightly higher profile lawyer. And I was probably occupying that responsibility in our state to some extent before this happened. So when I heard about this, and I'm a farm kid, my family still farms, I have farmland, my brother farms it for me. I thought, you know, these guys aren't going to know what a goddamn easement is. Uh, so I decided, you know, I'd go up to my home county in the northeast corner of the state and uh, just give the farmers a seminar and say, here's what it's about. Here's what an easement is. Here's how condemnation works. When these guys come around, you know, be prepared for them. And there wasn't litigation for me to get at that point. So I, did, I had one of those meetings. My brother had some of his neighbors come. I was asked to go to another county seat town, another 50 or 60 miles to the west, the next weekend. And I expected 15 or 20 people. There were 150 there. And I decided after that meeting we should form a nonprofit organization that we called the Nebraska Easement Action Team. We probably spent $75 on little posters like that, put up a little website, gave it that name. And we got almost everybody on the proposed pipeline corridor across the state to join that thing. And that's how we did it. 
the question for Dave is essentially how did he do the valuation and how did he consider complex issues like 50 years of a future work on the pipeline, things like that? Three answers. First, we sold tickets to the potential viewing of Mitt Romney digging the pipeline into the ground by himself with his own hands. <laughs> The, se the second thing that we did was, uh, was that we went to the legislature and uh, we proposed, uh, got some senators there to introduce legislation that would have uh, required that the Public Service Commission issue a permit. One of the issues in our case was whether the statute that helped us tie this up for years uh, contained a flaw because it didn't commit the subject to the Public Service Commission. We were pretty sure we were going to win that issue. So the le legislation we proposed would have authorized a maximum, this was our proposal, 10-year permits, renewal requirements, including proof of financial responsibility and maintenance of a, rem a removal reserve. The alternative to that that we proposed in court was that the easement had to be rewritten and that the court would not permit a taking without those features. We didn't expect to win that, but we made the argument in both places. I think on that, our time is up, and I want to thank our panel, a great panel. Thank you.